In his lecture series, Awakening from the Meaning Crisis, psychology professor John Verveke has called attention to the genesis of the meaninglessness which afflicts our age and its possible solutions. We find that the success of modern science and technology and a concomitant crisis of religious and philosophical ideals led to a secular worldview with no consensus as to the purpose or direction of human life. At an individual level, this means that we are no longer sure of the meaning of our lives and actions. We may still have jobs, fill out government forms, have witty conversations with friends, and post content online. But in the absence of a coherent worldview, these actions don't seem to have any ultimate purpose. The conquest of space with rockets, or even the transcendence of the death of the physical body with pills and devices, are not able to tell us what we are living for. The truth revealed by science seems to tell us too much, negating the frameworks that we previously lived by. There is a story science tells us. There is no law of God, only the cold necessity of the law of electron and proton. There is no soul, only mindless DNA reproducing and telling us to pursue selfish interest so we can reproduce. There are no miracles or interventions against this law. To current-day religious believers, it remains unclear the extent to which science really does negate the claims of religion. Science is an investigation of physical matter, and it cannot ultimately tell us about more than its scope. Yet because of its dazzling success in certain domains, we believe its story about everything. And in the wake of science's decimation of the structures of justification that previously ordered human life, we are unclear how we can or should live. What is the purpose of any of our actions if we are simply biological beings that are driven to reproduce? How are we to live out our cherished ideals if they are simply patterns that go off in the brain? Yet life goes on whether it has a philosophical justification or not. We are then left with the question, what are we to do? Verveke suggests that it is an ecology of practices that will give us the pathway forward. Organized religion with its monolithic top-down ideologies may no longer be tenable for many, but a decentralized ecology of practices may be able to help us cultivate an approach to life that is fulfilling and workable, even in the current lack of a philosophical structure of meaning. In the lecture series, he especially focuses on mindfulness as a tool that helps us get an optimal grip on the world, or in other words, helps us orient ourselves towards self and world in a more effective way. Mindfulness is a tool that was imported into Western culture from Buddhism, which has often been interpreted in the West as a path of pursuing wisdom and enlightenment through right use of the mind without the fetters of religious dogma. It has therefore been congenial to post-religious Western spiritual seeking, but it is not the only practice that can help us navigate the meaning crisis. Practices that are commonly pursued to seek meaning within the context of the meaning crisis include psychotherapy, neo-shamanic practice, and movement practices like yoga and qigong. What these practices have in common is that they are support practices. They are usually undertaken in one's free time to gain wisdom and insight that helps support the main activities and responsibilities of life. But is it possible to bring wisdom to bear on the main activities and responsibilities of life themselves? There is such a practice that comes from the Indian subcontinent called karma yoga, the practice of action. It is one of the main ideas of the well-known scripture, the Bhagavad Gita. The Gita is a text that holds great importance in the Hindu tradition, becoming prominent at least as far back as the commentary on it by philosopher Adi Shankara in the 8th century AD. It deals with the dilemma of the warrior Arjuna facing battle and wavering in his resolve to fight. The incarnated god Krishna holds a dialogue with him and provides counsel both practical and metaphysical. It is spoken to generations of readers in many contexts, but one reason why I may answer well to our meaning crisis today is because Arjuna, too, was undergoing a crisis of meaning. Rather than prescribing meditation, Krishna suggests that a way forward for Arjuna 
could be found by performing action with the right attitude. Just as mindfulness has been adapted from an ancient context to help with the meaning crisis, this practice of action may prove useful to us in dealing with the meaning crisis as another element in a rich ecology of practices. To understand why Krishna prescribes action, we must understand the central conflict of the scripture. The Gita is a section from a larger epic poem called the Mahabharata. In the Mahabharata, there is a war as two rival factions of a family dispute who is the rightful successor to the throne, with the Pandava clan on one side and the Kaurava clan on the other. Both parties, in fact, have reasonable claims to the throne, introducing an element of moral ambiguity into the story. In this battle, the hero of the Gita, Arjuna, is an archer for the Pandavas, but on the battlefield he feels a sense of despair and confusion about whether he should fight, feeling that he should not slay his family members. Quote, I foresee no good resulting from slaughtering my kin in war, unquote, he says. He claims initially to be beyond the desire for victory. Quote, I have no wish for victory, nor for kingship and its pleasures, unquote, he states perhaps implying that it is only the selfish personal desire for victory that could induce a warrior to engage in battle. He argues that it would be evil to kill family members, and that by killing family members he would bring about the destruction of the family system and then the downfall of society itself. Arjuna, in his dilemma, experiences a version of a meaning crisis. To be sure, the meaning crisis in contemporary Western civilization has specific contingent philosophical, historical, and sociological roots that are not shared in Arjuna's situation. Arjuna is not dealing with the collapse of established religion due to the advent of a scientific worldview. He is not dealing with the inability to connect with the broader society due to the fragmentation of community structures or the inability to situate his actions in a meaningful way due to the alienation of labor but he is dealing with the failure to see how to act when his previous standards for living collapse in the face of a novel situation. His previous warrior's dharma, or law of action, is unable to guide his action in the face of a battle between the different parts of his own family. He does not know how to proceed or what the potential positive outcome could be of any action he could take. Arguably, the meaning crisis in general is about action. Those who are deeply involved in the activities they are doing, whether building companies or creating art or raising families, are not worrying about the philosophical meaning crisis. The meaning crisis occurs specifically when action becomes impossible, when we don't see the dharma or right way of living unfolding before us. This does not imply any particular direction of causation. It could be that the contemplation of the philosophical crisis makes us unable to act, or it could be that the fact that there is no satisfying action leads us to a philosophical crisis. But the resolution to the meaning crisis is concomitant with the right flow of action. The open question is how that right flow of action can be reestablished. The ecology of practices approach that Verveki advocates means that meditation, shamanism, qigong, and other practices are ways in which the flow of meaning and action can be reestablished. The argument of this piece is that action itself, done in the right way, can be a part of the ecology of practices that resolves the meaning crisis. In the meaning crisis, we find ourselves, like Arjuna, in a crisis where our actions seem meaningless and purposeless. Why, then, should action be undertaken at all? The meaning crisis registers when the right way of action, and even action itself, becomes questionable and thus we may be tempted into renunciation of action, thinking that it is the best way to deal with the problem of action. If the business world is run by the exploitative engine of capitalism, and politics is a feud between two corrupt sides, is there anything to do but sit on the sidelines and refuse to act? By refusing to act, can we reach wisdom? The Gita has a paradoxical attitude towards renunciation, but in the end supports the path of action for Arjuna. On one hand, it admits that renunciation can be a valid path to perfection. In the first part of verse 5.2, Krishna says, quote, 
Yoga and renunciation will both lead to ultimate bliss, unquote. Renunciation of action is not just an arbitrary path, but if pursued rigorously, can lead to the highest spiritual state. And yet this very verse closes with, quote, but the yoga of action is better than renunciation, unquote. The point of this passage isn't to condemn one path and elevate another. The entire second half of chapter 4 is filled with the virtues of various paths, and the attitude is ultimately Catholic. Rather than try to determine a final value ranking from the paradoxical attitude, it is more helpful to understand the Gita's critique of the concept of renunciation. Renunciation is not ultimately to be compared or contrasted with action because they are ultimately not two separate paths. Renunciation is a form of action. Quote, so what is action and non-action? This confuses even poets. Unquote. Even if one tries to renounce action by staying secluded, one is still engaging in action. One must do basic bodily tasks and feed oneself. There is the necessity of the upkeep of one's living situation. Even in these basic tasks, one is impacting the world, and that has an effect on the society around you. Your non-active lifestyle may provoke condemnation or resistance from family and friends. Or if you live in the forest, you'll be acting on the trees and the forest life. So long as one is embodied, one is engaged in interchange with the environment which produces actions within it. A deconstruction of the binary between action and non-action made us appeal to a sort of scientific analysis. If we analyze the microscopic behaviors and interactions and zoom in perhaps to the cellular or atomic level, we can always find action happening. But the thought of the Gita also makes a subtler psychological point. Quote, Not even for a moment does someone exist without acting. Even against one's will, one acts by the nature-born qualities. Unquote. These nature-born qualities are tamas, sattva, and rajas, discussed by the Samkhya school of Indian philosophy. They were understood as modes of nature, so ascribed to the cosmos at large, but we would understand them as psychological principles. Tamas is the quality of darkness and sloth, rajas is the quality of passion, and sattva is the principle of pure knowledge. In the Samkhya theory, an individual is always subject to these qualities. Even if one chooses to renounce the overt action of driving one's car to the office, one will still be subject to passion when it inevitably rises again in one's consciousness and it will drive one to some sort of action, even against one's will. Because of this, renunciation is not even truly possible for Arjuna. Krishna advises him, quote, If because of egotism you think, No, I will not fight, vain is your resolution, for your own nature will compel you, unquote. The application to the meaning crisis is clear. Even if we try to renounce action, we will still be driven to action. We will be forced to confront the economic circumstances that we find ourselves in. We will have to deal with our base appetites for food and sex. We will be subject to the reactions that political media stimulates us to and will be polarized to one or the other side. And like every modern person, almost without exception, we will be attached to the dopamine stream coming from our smartphone. It may be possible to develop some extreme discipline that counters the effects of the modern forces that are warring for our attention, but that discipline, that monk mode, will be a highly effortful, highly cultivated state of being that is clearly a form of action in itself. By virtue of being in the world, we are always already involved in action, no matter how inactive that action may seem. Rather than renounce battle, Krishna encourages Arjuna to take action and fight. At first, Krishna uses whatever psychological levers might serve the purpose of getting Arjuna to rise to the battle. He initially criticizes Arjuna's, quote, weakness so unsuited to one high-born, unquote, essentially attempting to shame him into fighting. But over several passages of a dialogue, interspersed with comments on metaphysics, wisdom practices, and renunciation, Krishna outlines a theory and practice of action that can be used to reach the goal of all spiritual seeking, the attainment of the Supreme. 
The core practice of action in the Gita has several principles. Krishna explains several of them in verses 247 and 48. Quote, Your concern should be with action, never with an action's fruits. These should never motivate you, nor attachment to inaction. Established in this practice, act without attachment, Arjuna, unmoved by failure or success. Unquote. In action, one must perform the necessary actions without desire for the fruits of actions. Why is this desirable, and how is it even possible? After all, one could easily imagine a theory of action in which action itself has no essential importance, and the only reason to undertake action is to acquire the fruits of action. To understand the meaning of this principle, it will be helpful to understand the critique of desire in Indian spiritual thought. In Vedantic thought, the Absolute is termed Brahman, and is conceived as a transcendent reality. It is on one hand beyond mental understanding, but at the same time it can be provisionally understood as Satchitananda, a triune principle of existence, consciousness force, and bliss. Through spiritual discipline, it is possible for the individual consciousness to be united with Brahman. In such a consciousness, one is in touch with the absolute reality of existence, the movements of conscious will, and the absolute state of bliss. Being in touch with this bliss, there is no need to seek for bliss through the possession of any other object or state. In other words, there is no need to desire any object, possession, or status, because the ultimate bliss is already possessed. Desirelessness is thus concomitant with identification with the Supreme Consciousness. But when the spiritual aspirant goes in the reverse direction, starting with the lower consciousness and attempting to conduct spiritual discipline with the aim of attaining the Supreme Consciousness, it is often advised to renounce desire with the aim of becoming like the Supreme Consciousness. Hence, Krishna advises Arjuna here to renounce the desire in the context of action. Action often goes with the desire for the fruits of action, but in yoga it is generally advised to renounce desire, so in the yogic practice of action, desire must be renounced. But this leads to a natural question. If not for the fruits of action, why should action be undertaken? Various schools of philosophy are in conflict regarding the answer to this question. A prominent reply comes in certain schools of Buddhism and Hinduism, which argue that if there is no desire, then there is no need for the manifested universe at all, and the natural consequence of expunging desire through spiritual endeavor will be the end of manifestation at the individual level and eventually at the cosmic level. Schools which advocate this view usually argue that dharma, or right action, is still provisionally necessary so long as one is embodied in the world, and that negative consequences will accrue from acting against dharma. Yogi and philosopher Sri Aurobindo, whose philosophy may be termed integral Vedanta, instead gives a positive role for the manifestation of the universe even without the distortion of the principle of desire, in contradiction to the aforementioned non-dual schools of both Buddhism and Hinduism. He advances the position that the manifested universe is the working out of potentialities latent in Brahman, so that the universe is the lila, or play, of the potentialities of Brahman. In this play, all entities proceed to manifest themselves according to an idea contained in their essence, and this idea, unique to each entity, provides the law which is their dharma. Support for this idea can be taken from verse 8 of the Isha Upanishad, quote, The seer, the thinker, the one who becomes everywhere, the self-existent, has ordered objects perfectly according to their nature from years sempiternal, unquote. In this view, the objects or entities of the universe act according to their nature, their internal law or dharma, and express themselves through their actions in the universe. This idea of dharma as a natural law can be understood through analogy to pre-human manifestation of nature. It is the nature of a body to fall towards the earth. It is the nature of a bee to fly through the air and pollinate flowers. So it is with the dharma of the actors in the human scene. It is the nature of the king to rule, and for the archer to skillfully shoot arrows, and so on. It is this notion of dharma that is able to justify the purpose of action without recourse to desire. 
Brahman is self-existent and has no desire for any object, possession, or status. Yet he does have an infinity of potentialities, each with their own dharma to unfold. Desireless action is thus the action of Brahman, unfolding the dharma of his potentialities. And the endeavor towards desireless action in the spiritually aspiring human being is the attempt for their action to be like that of Brahman. Desireless action is thus advised by Krishna. One should not desire the fruits of action, but should do actions according to the true dharma without regard for the fruits. The second principle beyond desireless action, advised by the same previous quotation, is to be, quote, unmoved by failure or success, unquote. In other words, there must be a wide equality towards all outcomes of action. Brahman, in himself perfect and self-existent, works out his infinite potentialities in a world of finitude and imperfection. Finite entities within this manifestation attempt to express their nature through their dharma, but inevitably conflict with other entities, or find that their force is insufficient to carry out the task they have in view. This may give the local appearance of failure. This does not discourage Brahman, which is Satchitananda, standing behind, supporting the failure through pure existence and force of consciousness, and taking bliss even in what appears to be an unsatisfactory situation. Similarly, Brahman meets success with an equal existence, consciousness, and bliss without getting caught in a superficial agitated joy. Brahman is thus unmoved by failure and success, and therefore the aspirant to the status of Brahman must attempt to be equal to failure and success as well. The true satisfaction in action is acting according to dharma and not the success of action. There is a third principle of the practice of action, which is that action should be offered as a sacrifice to Brahman. Quote, this world is bound by action, save for action which is sacrifice, unquote, Krishna advises, before going on to discuss the importance of sacrifice to the gods. Later, he states that those who, quote, yield all acts to me, unquote, will attain redemption. Why does Krishna place so much importance on the idea of sacrifice? It can be difficult for the modern mind to appreciate the importance of sacrifice in the ancient Indian worldview. Sacrifice was seen as a cosmological principle that ordered the universe. The archetypal sacrifice was the offering of material possessions or even animal lives to deities for the purpose of worship. The underlying meaning of a sacrifice is that something precious to the individual is offered up to the deity selflessly as a gift, which shows the deity that the individual holds a reverential attitude towards them. Within that context, the Gita creatively suggests that rather than offering gold and cattle as a sacrifice, humans may offer their very actions as sacrifices to Brahman. These actions must of course be offered with the same attitude that other religious sacrifices are offered, selflessly and as an act of worship. But this provides a way for the practice of life itself to be made an offering to the divine. If we are to practice action in the current context, there is one more open question, which is the question of just what is one's dharma. Ancient civilizations were willing to assign duties according to a fixed social order. Kings had one set of duties, and peasants had another much more restrictive one, and there was no recourse for altering the system. People living in such societies experienced a lack of freedom in social rules that might seem very confining to a modern person. However, in one sense, from the perspective of meaning, it meant at least that there was less scope for a meaning crisis, as there was no awareness that there could be an alternative to the social role one found oneself in. Philosopher of meaning David Chapman calls this the choiceless mode of meaning, because people in these societies were unable to make choices regarding their social roles, and thus their possibilities of meaning in life. For better or worse, the Gita and other religious texts sometimes served to spiritualize a rigid political philosophy, arguing that politically prescribed duties and systems were ordained by God. Part of the reason for the meaning crisis in current Western societies is that we no longer live in such a choiceless mode, but in conditions of relative material abundance and political freedom, and are unsure of what to do with that freedom. 
we don't have a clear idea of what dharma is, or of our place in society and in the world. As John Verveke notes in his lectures, in the West, the Christian religion was able to provide an account of how the world was organized, the direction of history, and the destiny of the individual that gave a rationale and meaning to individual lives. This religious structure was undermined by movements of critical philosophy, the Reformation, the Scientific Revolution, and the Enlightenment. Most people would not want to turn back these developments, but the structure that previous stages of society provided in terms of the duties, behaviors, and modes of life they prescribed has proved hard to replace. The Gita is a text that was written in a certain time and place. The significance of the Gita for us is not that we should aim to copy the social structures and conditions that were in place at the time of its writing and live its message by duplicating its context. Rather, we should be inspired by what it still has to teach us in the context of our lives today. We would never aim to give up our freedom and trade it in for rigid social roles prescribed to us by unaccountable religious authority. Yet, while the Gita does not tell us what our Dharma should be, there are useful hints to provide us guidance as to how we may use our freedom to discover what our Dharma may be. One indication is the possibility of righteous action. Early in the dialogue, Krishna tells Arjuna that he should perceive the battle as righteous. Quote, Nor should you tremble to perceive your duty as a warrior. For him there is nothing better than a battle that is righteous. O son of Pritha, warriors rejoice in fighting such as that. Unquote. The battle that Arjuna is ambivalent about is not an arbitrary contest between two equally guilty parties. Instead, it is a field where there is a righteous duty to be done, indeed one that is sanctioned by the god Krishna himself. The possibility of righteous action negates the meaning crisis's claim of meaninglessness. If one is willing to perceive the particularities of the events of the world, rather than holding out that everything is meaningless a priori, one will find that there are indeed some causes and programs that are more righteous and thus meaningful than others. There are righteous causes in the world, causes which we can engage with our gifts, talents, and propensities and make a difference in. Postmodern relativism, or even classical skepticism, may have us convinced that there is nothing in the field of society but the play of interests on all sides, where there is no possibility of determining a right cause to fight on behalf of. But in fact, if we pay close attention to the field of activities and take Krishna allegorically as an inner voice that we may listen to, we may find that there is indeed a righteous action to be taken. A second clue is given by the quote, better to do one's own duty ineptly than another's well, unquote. The specific phrase used in the Sanskrit original for one's own duty is the phrase svadharma, meaning specifically the dharma of the individual in their personal context as opposed to the phrase dharma, which, while it may apply to the individual, is often used to mean the idea of the universal law in a broad global sense. The concept of svadharma on one hand indicated the specific dharma that applied to one's contextual situation, in the sense that the svadharma of a shopkeeper differs from that of a university student. But it also points to the possibility that one's svadharma can be discovered by following the law of one's own being. This is pointed out by the colloquial phrase, finding one's calling. A similar concept is the union process of individuation, or finding one's own unique expression of personality and life. To be sure, there is a possibility of error as one searches for this inner calling. One may be led to follow fashion, or one's venal desires, or may simply fail to find anything that truly amounts to an individualized way of life. But allowing people the freedom to make mistakes in the search for their calling is better than rigid structures which force people into paths they don't want to take. While society may enact laws and consequences needed for its orderly operation, there is ultimately nobody other than oneself who can assign a dharma onto another person, and the svadharma, according to which the practice of action holds, must ultimately come from one's own judgment and inner calling. Thus we have the outlines of the practice of action. Actions must be performed desirelessly according to dharma, in a spirit of equality, as a sacrifice to the Brahman. But why should we perform actions this way? 
and how does this help to solve the meaning crisis? Arjuna encounters a meaning crisis, and as we have already discussed, Krishna does not recommend the renunciation of action as a way out of the meaning crisis, in part because action is inevitable. But that does not give a positive reason for undertaking the practice of action Krishna suggests. The end that that path of action aims at in the Gita is spoken of in a similar vocabulary to the goal in other contexts of the Indian spiritual tradition. The translation of the text referenced by this essay uses various words and terms including the divine condition, perfection, and the highest. At the end of chapter 2, the Gita specifically identifies this state as a state of peace beyond suffering, desire, and ego. However, definitions of these terms and their correspondence to specific psychological and material statuses remains debated among spiritual schools to this day. The Gita is not overly specific about what this means and does not make a unique contribution to this discourse. What we need to know in the context of the present discussion is not the precise definition of spiritual liberation or ego, but whether the practice of action can lead to a solution to the meaning crisis. For Arjuna, the idea of attaining the supreme or liberation from ego may have been an inducement that made sense to him as a reason to pursue the path of action because that made sense within his context and belief system. For some in a modern context, the promise of peace and freedom from suffering may be an inducement. Others of us may need a more specific pointer to what the result of this path may be. Once again, we may take a cue from Sri Aurobindo, who in addition to being a philosopher, was a practitioner of the yoga of action. He writes in one of his volumes of Letters on Yoga, quote, The completeness, the siddhi, perfection, of this way of yoga, I speak of the separate path of karma or spiritual action, begins when one is luminously aware of the guide and the guidance, and when one feels the power working with oneself as the instruments and the participator in the divine work, unquote. When one surrenders one's actions to Brahman, one becomes united with the unfolding of Brahman's action in contrast to a non-perfected state where we are separated from the stream of the universal action by the incorrect identification of the mind. To be moved by a force larger than oneself, indeed by the supreme power of the universe, into an expression of spiritual energy. For many, such an experience would indeed solve the crisis of meaning where the significance and purpose of one's actions comes into severe doubt. The theoretical conception of this practice of action has so far been within the tradition of Indian spiritual philosophy. We elaborated on such ideas as why desire must be renounced, sacrificing actions to Brahman, and the results of the path all in terms of the Hindu conception of Brahman as the absolute. But a key condition of the current meaning crisis is that the religious forms and structures which previously provided meaning to life are now under critique by scientific consciousness undermining their claim to validity. To be sure, we cannot assume that Indian philosophy is subject to the same critiques as Christianity just because they are both religious belief systems. But on the other hand, we cannot uncritically import other belief systems into a Western worldview and simply assume that they are valid or beyond critique. Rather than attempting to directly reconcile metaphysical systems, I will instead suggest how the practice of action may be framed within a secular worldview for those who hold one, in a similar way that meditation was able to be transplanted from a religious worldview to a secular one via its framing as mindfulness. This fits into the project posed by Verveki and others of naturalistic spirituality, or viewing spiritual endeavors as compatible with a secular scientific worldview. Desirelessness, dharma, and equality do not in fact depend on any specific metaphysical theory. They can be elegantly justified and explained with respect to the metaphysical properties of Brahman, but do not in themselves require any supernatural belief. Instead, they deal with the stuff of everyday life. It does not require any supernatural explanation or justification to advise doing the best job possible at the practical task at hand without concern for praise or blame, success or failure. This idea may lack a metaphysical justification, but it is possible that it will still be appealing for people. 
This is similar to how Christian moral concepts like equality and dignity no longer have the justification of Christian metaphysics, but remain broadly appealing despite lacking a proof, as Michael Bonner notes in In Defense of Civilization. There are certainly connections that can be made between these ideas and other schools of thought and systems of justification, like pragmatism, Aristotelian virtue ethics, and Stoicism. But a more relevant consideration seems to me to be whether Krishna's speech serves as an inspiring ideal. After that, there are many ways of connecting these principles to the specific metaphysical framework any individual believes in. The more difficult idea from the practice of action to reconcile with a secular worldview is the idea of sacrificing actions to Brahman. It is not at all clear what this would mean in a secular worldview where there is no reason to sacrifice anything and no one to sacrifice anything to. The idea of intentionality can bridge the gap. In the absence of an idea of an absolute of existence, consciousness, bliss that an aspirant would offer actions to, I suggest instead that actions can be performed with the intent to benefit the highest ideal that one holds. This ideal may be something as grand as world peace or as localized as the idea of providing for one's family. Or it need not be a humanitarian aim at all, as the artist may strive towards the ideal of a perfect beauty. But action should be taken with the intent of advancing or contributing to an ideal. A grand ideal can accept even small offerings, as a political campaign requires the great acts of the one on stage as well as the small, detail-oriented work of the one mailing campaign flyers. Ideals can change over the course of one's life. The important thing for the one following the practice of action is that action should be offered to the highest ideal that one has in view at a given time. The psychological movement of offering actions, though perhaps initially unfamiliar, can actually be practiced with the aid of metaphor similarly to non-secular practice. The organizing ideal of the secular worldview instituted with the Age of Enlightenment has been progress. In the new absence of a god whose plan ratifies the deeds of the actors in the world, and the enthroning of reason in its place, there has been a want of an ideal that can inspire and organize human effort. Progress of knowledge, science, and technology has been the predominant answer. Human action is sanctioned only when it is deemed to contribute to this forward march. Progress is indeed the only justification for action in the world today. We can therefore see progress as an attempted solution to the meaning crisis. So long as actions contribute to this narrative, they are deemed as meaningful. But does it truly touch the roots of the meaning crisis? Has there really been progress, and is that enough to satisfy man's thirst for meaning? Along certain vectors, there has been progress towards particular aims, like the incidence of certain diseases, the discovery of certain scientific advances, or the literacy rate. The partisans of progress will always be able to provide statistics showing that progress has been made. The central failure of progress is not in the increase of any specific measurable metric, but a more fundamental one, in that progress is not a substitute for transcendence in the way that the secular worldview tries to claim. At the end of certain measurable advances, Material and measurable progress has not directly brought man closer to a transcendent state, and thus a disappointment sets in. We can view this as a failure of an attempt at solving the meaning crisis. One may argue that progress was never intended to do that, but that was indeed the solution that the ideal of progress was attempting. Thus it is possible for people to get disillusioned with the ideal of progress and want to cast it aside. Taking the Gita as an indication of a solution, however, We will not cast aside action out of a sense of disillusionment with the possibility of progress. Rather, we will continue to act, finding other ideals, or even taking the absolute itself as the end to which we sacrifice our action. Through intentionality towards ideals, the practice of action can be made compatible with secularism and can allow for more flexibility than the narrow view that progress is the only aim worth pursuing. Thus, the practice of action remains a coherent one in a secular frame, still made up of desireless action according to Dharma, and a spirit of equality offered to the highest ideal one has in view. But what about the conception of the results? The end state in the religious practice of action was interpreted in terms of a supernatural divine power. 
Is there a way of understanding the result state of the practice of action in a secular way? The spiritual practice of action, karma yoga, has not been studied in the same depth that mindfulness meditation has. But action in general has been studied by psychologists. One hint as to what the results of the practice of action may be like is given by the flow state studied by psychologist Mahalgi Shikshant Mahalgi. The flow state is a state where one is absorbed in activity and feels an intuitive connection to the work at hand, just like the jazz musician is at one with the notes and emotions they improvise with, or the basketball player is in an intuitive unity with the movements of the ball and the balletic movements of their team. Chiksen Mahalyi proposed that the flow state occurred under special conditions, specifically situations with clear goals, immediate feedback, and a balance of skill with the situation. These are not present in all human action, but there is a notable similarity in the reports of the secular flow state and the results of spiritual karma yoga elaborated earlier by Sri Aurobindo. It is thus not unreasonable to surmise that the secular flow state may also be similar to the results of a secular practice of action. The experiments of practitioners and researchers may shed more light on the results of this practice in a secular context. The experiences of a secular framework may not turn out to be the exact same as those pursued in a religious framework, just as the practice of meditation may lead to a different experience in a secular versus a religious context. But there is enough promise in the idea of the flow state to indicate the practice of action may have a role in dealing with the meaning crisis. We have seen that a practice of action consists in doing actions desirelessly, according to Dharma, as an offering to Brahman for one's highest ideals. Such a practice is advised to Arjuna by Krishna to help him get out of his own crisis of meaning. His meaning crisis has a very different philosophical, historical, and sociological underpinning from the one we are facing but the psychological result is similar. He is left in a state of confusion, unable to see the purpose of life or action. The actions and possibilities in front of the modern meaning crisis experiencer seem pointless, because in the condition of the meaning crisis, the world does not seem to offer meaningful possibilities for the present or future. But others have faced down similar crises of meaning, and through their action built the world that we inhabit today. The Gita is a text that has inspired many to navigate these crises where all possibilities are dark and cast in doubt. If we are open to its message, we may find that now is not the time to renounce action, but is rather the time to undertake action in a different spirit and see if our experience transforms.